Good morning to you all and uh, very, a lot of uh, thanks for joining the event uh, this morning. And uh, I would like to welcome our dear guest speakers, our dear colleagues um, and you as viewers. So um, we are going to discuss a very important topic, the future of the EU-Africa relations. And it will also mark the launch of the policy paper on the same topic that uh, I myself, I am Samira Rafaela, uh, drafted together with my dear colleagues, Prisula Saharopoulou and uh, Javier Nart. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, my colleagues uh, and your staff for the good cooperation during the drafting process. And during this webinar, uh, we will hear contributions from five guest speakers who will discuss the future of EU-Africa relations from a development, trade and investment and foreign and security policy perspective. So our guest speakers are Mrs. Maria Martin Prat. She is Deputy Director General in the European Commission uh, Directorate general trade, and she's responsible for, amongst other topics, the trade relations with Africa and trade and sustainable development. Uh, we have Mr. Ashaykh Ibn Umar. He is Minister of National Reconciliation and Dialogue for the Republic of Chad. Um, we have Mrs. Sandra Kramer. She is Director in the European Commission, Director General International Partnerships, where she works on EU-African uh, relations. Then we have Mr. Anadif Katir Mohamed Saleh. He is a special representative for West Africa and the Sahel and head of the United Nations Office for West Africa and the Sahel. And we have Mrs. Pamela Coke Hamilton. She is the ex executive director of the International Trade Center, the development agency that is full, fully dedicated to supporting the internationalization of small and medium sized enterprises. And we are really happy and honored that you can join uh, the panel. This is a great panel of speakers. So I would um, uh, like to uh, st uh, start with a short introduction before we start. Um, and uh, I would like to officially now launch the Renew Euro Policy paper on the future of the EU-Africa relations. And with this paper, uh, Renew reaffirms its commitment to the African continent. And the paper addresses a comprehensive approach towards EU-Africa relations and engages with many important topics. It is high time that the EU and Africa launched a new strategic partnership based on equality and inclusiveness. Africa and Europe are intertwined as continents and we depend on each other. It is therefore high time that the EU, the African Union and both it both its member states engage in constructive cooperation to promote sustainable development of the African continent and advancing our common interests through cooperation on a multilateral level is the first step in this regard. Together, the EU and Africa can advance a common agenda based on mutual understanding and the EU should do more to promote education for young uh, people to ensure women and uh, girls have control uh, over their own lives. Um, additionally, strengthening uh, African countries, uh, higher education systems, um, and also to see where we have opportunities to uh, provide to the younger generation. And an important, an important aspect of strengthening the resilience of Africa is gender equality efforts with more women and girls included in politics, the economy and society, Africa can flourish. And if we take trade in as, an, as an example, there is a lot to improve. Trade should benefit all actors involved and especially women. Uh, they often lack access to finance, uh, skills development or have troubles exporting their products. And we need to address this in our relations with Africa. Additionally, we should make sure that African SMEs can compete equally with EU businesses on a level playing field. And through our trade relations with the African continent, the EU can promote our values as well. Negotiations can function as a platform to address issues like human rights, environment, digitalization, gender, and the rule of law. And by engaging with African actors on, for example, sustainability, an atmosphere of inclusive and equal cooperation can emerge. And this in turn can lead to an investment climate on the African continent that can contribute to the development of, of Africa. Another important aspect the EU can do more is food security, poverty and mal malnutrition on the African uh, continent by investing in education and training, 
sustainable agricultural should be further promoted by the EU and Africa. And by developing a fair and sustainable food system, African companies can compete on the EU market within a level playing, level playing field and with the same standards. In addition, the EU must effectively support African countries and in their implementation of the Paris Agreement. Key in this regard is nationally uh, determined contributions and reinforcing capacity, building and knowledge transfers. And beyond working with Africa to create a resilient economy and society, the EU needs to do more to support democratic processes and empower democratic actors through its development corporation. Engaging with African countries on good governance and supporting them must include all people in society, especially um, uh, women who want to become active in politics. At the, as the paper addresses, legal migration opportunities for African nationals should be expanded through legal migration. Africans and Europeans can be in share their knowledge with each other. And this, is, uh, this eventually promotes the cohesion and contact between our continents. And lastly, the EU needs to rethink how its foreign and security policy shaped qualified majority voting in certain areas of foreign policy should be introduced uh, by introducing this step, a swift European response to assist our African partners with, for example, a threat of instability and possible conflict is possible. And we're not, at, we're not all EU uh, 27 are willing or able to act, coalition formats should be encouraged. And the EU and Africa together have the potential to shape the future for the younger generation on both of the continents. And it's very important to see each other as equal partners. Um, we have these common topics that we can work on. We have these common values that we need to work on. Um, and the EU uh, and Africa both, we have a crucial play, crucial role to play uh, in our world uh, as uh, being twin continents. Um, and if we work together towards our com common goals and interests, uh, we can achieve many steps uh, for both of the continents. Thank you very much. So I would like to give the floor to our first speaker today, Mrs. Uh, Maria Martin Pratt. For um, please, you have uh, uh, a couple of minutes, eight minutes for your introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Thanks. Thanks, and uh, let me start by uh, welcoming not only the, the event, but also uh, the policy paper that you have put on the table. We see that as a very a good uh, and timely opportunity to discuss our closer engagement with Africa. Uh, you know that uh, I will be speaking here from the point of view of trade policy uh, and uh, first point I would like to make is that our trade agreements uh, support the implementation of the communication uh, that we adopted in 2018 on Africa Europe Alliance for Sustainable Investment and Jobs. They are also a tool uh, to implement our strategy towards uh, Africa that we adopted in 2020. And I think uh, the central point to our strategy, as, as you were already uh, saying, is to work as equal partners uh, and to try to put together our strengths. In our case, uh, is trade as part of our economic uh, pillar and as a major element to promote sustainable development of African countries. Now, this objective, uh, recently now when we did a review of our trade uh, policy and in, in that review of our trade policy, we do propose to step up our engagement with Africa. Uh, we all believe in the strong economic potential of the continent, for the continent itself and for its population, uh, but also for the relations we have with the continent. And we have proposed uh, a number of what we call headlines actions. First of all, we do want to support political dialogue and cooperation with the African Union and its members and the implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. 
Second, we want to deepen and widen our existing trade agreements with African countries and regions, and we want to strengthen their sustainability dimension. Uh, third, we want to explore further the possibility of enhancing links and synergies between the EU different trade arrangements with African countries. And fourth, we want to have sustainable investment initiative with countries or with regions in Africa that are interested in taking part. This, this defines how we would like to take forward uh, our trade policy and our cooperation uh, with African countries and the continent. Uh, and we understand this is also important in the longer term perspective of a continent uh, to continent free trade agreement, uh, which is a highly ambitious objective, which I think uh, needs uh, deep integration uh, on, on both sides. Uh, that is why we think that the work we are doing now, uh, the building of our relations, as I said, uh, with individual com com countries, but also uh, regional uh, groupings, is extremely important from, from our point of view. Um, in terms of these uh, headlines uh, and the EU support to the Africa Continental FTA, I would like to just say that first, uh, our dialogue has a role to play. Uh, the African Union has shown great interest in the dialogue with the European Union on matters of economic integration, and notably uh, those that they are discussing now uh, in the context of the Africa Continental FTA project. Uh, second, already with, as I was referring to our trade agreements, we are working towards closer economic integration and development, both for the production of products and of uh, provision of services, and we think that that economic integration is also very, very important in, in terms of the uh, overall and wider project. And uh, we believe that we can also use the cooperation we have and the opportunities our arrangements are providing to advance further, and you were already referring to that as well, to the aspects more directly related to trade and sustainable development. And there, uh, climate, environment, labor uh, are all aspects that are a very essential part of our trade policy these days. I don't want to go uh, further. I know you want us to have uh, limited in, in time interventions. I'm happy uh, to get into more detailed aspects in the course of, of the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Martin Pratt. I would like to give the floor to my colleague Javier Inart, and he will continue with the introduction of the speakers. Javier, please. Uh, well, thank you indeed. I don't know if a Sheikh is on board. Do we have a Sheikh in connection? Sheikh Ibn Umar. He is with us? Yes, he is with us, Javier. Yes. Well, I don't know if he's with us in direct line or if he's with us in a recorded declaration. Uh, anyway, if he's with us, let us give him the word. If not, let us go for the registered declaration. And uh, uh, we consider that sometimes the connection with Chad are not so good as we wished. That's why we, uh, with some, uh, let me say, prudence, ask him to produce a recorded declaration in order to have him on board in case that uh, the connection with, uh, with Chad is not as good as we wished. So uh, our uh, brother, Asheikh Ben Umar, in recording. Uh, Asheikh, you are there. Happy to see you. you Content de te voir. Voilà. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you but right. not so loud. There is a surrounding noise. Asheikh, uh, uh, you are very, 
Je, 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 on t'écoute pas tellement. On t'écoute très bas. Uh, I don't know. I will try the headphones. Voilà. Allons-y. Uh, C'est mieux comme ça. Voilà, oui, voilà. Is it better? Namshu, kulu kois. Ok. Excusez-moi. Uh, ok. Uh, can I start now? Oui, s'il vous plaît, mon cher. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I think that the big picture in the Sahara region is very well known uh, by everybody. So I don't need uh, to elaborate on the different uh, aspects and uh, the security threat, the development challenges, and uh, the, the political obstacles, and so on. So I just uh, want to focus on three or four points that uh, I think are very of, uh, of paramount importance uh, to, you know, to, uh, to, to, to understand the situation and to, to uh, you know, build our relationship between Africa and Europe on these uh, factors. Uh, first of all, Sheikh, Sheikh, excuse me. Si tu es plus à l'aise, tu peux parler en français. On a la Chèque, if you like, you can speak French. Uh, we have the translation, but as you wish. Alors, donc, euh, premièrement, je veux so, parler firstly, de la menace terroriste. I would like to talk about the terrorist threat. This threat will be with us for many years to come. Not because terrorists are strong or because our national armies in cooperation with our partners are incapable to uh, get rid of them. By the way, that's what they are doing. But this threat will persist because of the asymmetrical war. With that kind of war, when regular forces are not able to eradicate 100% of terrorists, it is considered as a failure of those forces and uh, we say that local governments, the French, the Americans, cannot get rid of them, even if though they are uh, beaten, militarily speaking. When terrorists are weakened, they are yet still able to um, massacre civilians, and it is considered as a victory of the terrorists. And people say that they are still strong, so it is about asymmetry, not only about the kind of operations that are carried out, but also in the media perception, in the um, opinion perception, people's perception. This is the f first point. Even if those groups are weakened, they will still find a way um, to um, kill people with makeshift means. and. Of course, local governments will be accused of being unable to protect their populations, including by uh, democratic forces in Africa and in Europe and elsewhere. Second point, a very important one, Libya. As long as this country will face chaos, as we know, it will still be exporting instability. It will be breeding and exporting uh, instability with rebels, human trafficking, terrorists. And granted, during the last few months, we have seen very positive developments in Libya, including with the Conference of Berlin, the letter to unify the Tripoli and Benghazi Tobruk governments. I do think that it will be uh, possible to uh, go ahead with that. But it will be important that the elections in Libya take place at the right time. And if they take place, uh, the parliament will have to be uh, put in place in Tripoli or insert while not having a real control of the outskirts of those cities, not even mentioning the big desert areas uh, at the border with Niger, with Sudan, and so on and so forth. 
So export of instability from Libya is a phenomenon we will need to learn to live with for many years to come, unfortunately. Pairs the despair of young people. As you know, our governments, in spite of the recommendations, um, not to use a stronger word, of the World Bank since their independence have not been able to build national economies that can produce goods, that can also absorb young workers, ex especially uh, young gr uh, graduated people that are frustrated, frustrated by violence, by clashes with the police in, on the streets, and sometimes they join uh, terrorist groups, and some of them, the most unfortunate die in the Mediterranean while trying to uh, reach the European shores. Finally, last factor, I hope I'm not too long. Last point I would like to quickly uh, address is the political factor. In all countries, there is a, a disproportionate situation between the uh, parties in power and the opposition parties. When you are in power, you have a disproportionate advantage compared to the opposition. Then opposition parties are weak because they are divided. They have a superficial rhetoric. They, knew, they do not put forward ideas genders, they rather inflame tensions, tribal, communitarist, sectarian tensions. Then um, armies have weaknesses, but of course uh, Chad, the Chadian army um, has advantages, it is more combative than other armies on the African um, continent, but it is the legacy of the history. Our army in Chad was composed by different groups of warriors. This is why it is efficient, by the way, because it is facing terrorists, uh, it is familiar with their methods, with the field they operate on, and sometimes even the sociology of those terrorists. These are the main points I wanted to stress. In transition authorities in Chad, we do think that the transition we are undergoing now is not a, just any choice. It is the only way possible for national unity, for stability, and also, obviously, for democracy. But that way is going to be um, faced with many obstacles. But we need to be strong, to be adamant and continue on that way. Also with the support of our, of our European and international partners. They need to understand the complexity of our situation and sometimes the need to take into account phenomena and factors that might not be very pleasant. Thank you. I do thank you, Asher, for this very real take on the situation and also the very nice overview of the situation. Now I would like to give the floor to Madame Sandra Kramer. Thank you very much. And thank you also Samira for your introduction. It's nice to meet you. Goedemorgen. <laughs> um, so Excellencies, mem Honourable Members and Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, I'm very happy to be with you today and to discuss your uh, paper and I very much welcome uh, the paper and your strong in U European Union relations. So congratulations with that paper. You know that um, Africa is a geopolitical priority for the European Union and for the commission of President von der Leyen, who made this partnership a priority for her commission, who traveled uh, within four days of taking office to uh, the Africa Union and who wants a strong partnership with Africa, which is essential in view of the global recovery from the crisis of building back better and also of achieving the sustainable development goals. So from um, the perspective of international partnerships, which is where I work 
and which is uh, now the name of the portfolio of my commissioner, Jutta Erpilainen, uh, let me just give you an overview of some of the building blocks which we proposed in March 2020 um, in a joint communication which is called Towards a Comprehensive Strategy with Africa. Um, two or three days after we tabled our proposals, a global pandemic, of course, was declared. And that is the situation that we have lived in now for over a year. Just on that, uh, to highlight that the European Union immediately mobilized um, a lot of support, 8 billion in total, uh, to help Africa face this crisis, both in terms of health, but also in terms of socioeconomic uh, fallout of the crisis. Uh, Team Europe is also the largest contributor to COVAX, uh, 3 billion, and that has led to 90 million doses being delivered to 131 countries around the world. And as you know, President von der Leyen has in uh, Rome at the Global Health Summit um, launched a Team Europe initiative to support vaccine manufacturing in Africa. Um, a very important uh, initiative of which work is ongoing uh, at the moment. So what were the uh, main building blocks that we proposed in March 2020, who are very valid still, um, also after the COVID-19 or while we are going towards the end of the tunnel. First of all, it's to boost Africa's green transition and to enable more Africans to access energy. Secondly, is to support Africa's digital transformation. And thirdly, is to help African economies grow and create jobs. Um, also to work at favorable business and investment climates and focus on education and skills, as well as closer economic cooperation regionally and in view of the Africa continental free trade area. And then, of course, the promotion of peace, security and good governance and work towards uh, together on migration and mobility. And your report shows that our views are very much aligned. Now, over the past year, we sought views. We made the process as inclusive as possible because the partnership should indeed be equal, should have mutual interests and responsibilities on both sides and uh, rest on respective and mutual interests and comprehension and also the maturity of the relationship. The hectic year we had was not um, without uh, difficulties, but we, we also had successes. We negotiated a new post Cotonou uh, agreement. We finalized our discussions on Ndiki Global Europe, which is the instrument with which we will cooperate. We introduced a new concept called Team Europe, where we work together very closely with member states, their development agencies and development finance institutions. We launched a new gender action plan called GAP3, which is important. And we are in the middle of a programming exercise currently going on to program what we will do in the years to come together. So let me highlight what we will focus on and also what struck me in the report uh, first of all, and then secondly, highlight a couple of concrete actions which I think are important in the report. And thirdly, come back to what I think is important and what Samira also said on education, youth and women. So firstly, a couple of important points which are in the report and also in our programming phase. Um, there's a strong alignment between the report and the proposed post Cotonou agreement in key priority areas such as human rights, democracy and governance, climate change, sustainable development and gro growth. And there's also a strong emphasis on job creation, investment and action in the field of sustainable and inclusive growth. And I welcome the importance recognized in the report for regional and continental economic integration. And I'm glad my colleague Maria is here who highlighted already some of the trade aspects and also welcome Pamela from the International Trade Center with whom we work a lot. Now, equally important are the green transition and energy access, as well as sustainable and resilient agriculture. So I, refer, I welcome in the report your reference to the AU-EU Green Pact, which could further catalyze the green transition. As regards environment and climate change, adaptation will be crucial, and it's important that we work together in implementing the Paris Agreement and improve resilience. I want to highlight the digitalization. 
as you did in your report, if we step up investments in digital solutions and bridge the digital divide in Africa, there's a huge potential for fostering inclusion and promoting human development. On human development, we agree of the utmost importance, especially given Africa's demographic realities and challenges. Growth and resilience rely on human capital and therefore the need to promote and invest in health and in education. All this with a focus on poverty eradication and fighting inequalities. Education is a particular priority for my commissioner, Erpi Leinen, and I'll get back to this in a moment. There's also increased cooperation at multilateral level, promoting good governance and human rights. And those are key elements of our partnership. It's also true for the Africa Union, European Union Peace and Security Partnership, where the EU wishes to cooperate even more closely with the African continent and international bodies such as the United Nations. We all know that a peaceful, secure and stable continent is a prerequisite to successful green transition and digital transformation and to achieve human development. On migration management, lastly, we agree that addressing the complex challenges and seizing opportunities both in Europe and Africa will be key. Strength and co cooperation is needed based on a comprehensive and human-based approach in line with the new pact for migration and asylum. Now, secondly, some of the concrete actions of interest in the report, I very much welcome uh, these, uh, this report because there's clear goals in it, especially joining forces with African countries to push for an ambitious international agreement at COP15, uh, the Biodiversity Convention in Kunming in October. Also creating platforms of knowledge sharing on human rights, good governance, including the challenges posed by the digital age. There's also an action plan in your report to support African SMEs. And I want to highlight that President von der Leyen launched a Team Europe initiative on investing in young businesses in Africa with objective to increase financial and technical support to small companies at various stages of their development. There's also a focus on the setup of an African coalition for digital skills and jobs involving African and European partners to engage in policy dialogue and raise awareness amongst policymakers and investing in sustainable agriculture. We all very much subscribe to these ideas. Then, of course, the further promotion of student and teacher exchanges between the two continents through Erasmus Plus and increased support to wildlife conservation. These are in your report and they are very much aligned uh, with uh, what we proposed in March 2020. Now, thirdly, a focus on education, youth and women. It's very welcome and fully aligned with the ambitions of our commissioner. Commissioner Erpilainen is committed to increase funding on education, which currently stands at around 7% to at least 10% of our budget. We will be engaging much more on education in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we identify Team Europe initiatives in this regard. The focus will be on girls and women and also on teacher training. Women and youth empowerment and participation are high on our agenda, and we consider that as vital cross-sectoral teams throughout all our proposed partnerships with Africa. And we agree that promoting people-to-people -people contact and mutual understanding between the young people of our continent is essential. Again, youth is a priority for Commissioner Erpi Leinen, who appointed a youth envoy and created youth sounding boards in some of our delegations. So in conclusion, uh, let me say that we're in a unique position to build back better uh, together, responding to the global challenges which affect all of us and which we have to face together. Sharing, shaping this new ambitious partnership fit for today's and tomorrow's realities is a priority. And the upcoming high level EU Africa meetings, including the EU AU summit in Brussels, early 2020 is an opportunity to allow us to discuss and agree on joint ambitions that we wanna focus on. So I think we have truly exciting times ahead Congratulations again with your paper and with your focus on Africa, our closest neighbor and our natural partner. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Kramer. Uh, Let me now give the floor to Amadine Amachale. Over to you. Anadif Mohamed Saleh. 
over to you. Anadif, over to you. Do you hear me? Kind of. I would like to thank my brother Nod and uh, his colleague for the pivotal work carried out by the European Parliament and thank you for this document which depicts uh, uh, the relationship we all aspire to between the EU and Africa and unfortunately the internet connection of the speaker is appalling and it will be very difficult to work. Let me say a few words on the Western Africa. Today Western Africa is facing one main challenge. Democracy. We've been witnessing uh, the democratic process um, in a quagmire for some years. It is in a quagmire and has been afflicted by violences and post-election um, conflicts. Some people have lost their lives and actually legal institutions, judicial institutions and judges are supposed to declare the results. As a consequence, I think that Africa and more specifically Western Africa I want to focus on today need to ask itself how the judiciary can be fine-tuned in order to answer the different challenges related to elections. More often than not, elections in Africa le lead to issues and we need to solve this situation. Second challenge, security and safety. It has already been mentioned and I won't uh, repeat what has already been said. I do agree with my uh, counterpart's analysis, so let's now move on to the third challenge. We need to integrate youth, youth in our actions. Today, youngsters, 60 to 70 percent of people in Africa and more specifically Western Africa are made out of youngsters. Youngsters who are now fresh meat for terrorists, youngsters who become migrants because they have no other choices. They go through the desert, go through the Sahara, go through uh, oceans and cross the Mediterranean because there is no other option. And your document talks about different challenges, education, health, good governance, human rights, uh, regional integration, trade. Challenges which indeed are a reality on the ground, but then we need a proper framework, a proper framework and a proper wording. We need to have a true and equal partnership. We should not be given lessons. I worked at the African Union from 2006 till 2010 and I think it's important to review our relationship and have a true partnership. We need to put an end to the other types of relations. Let me now talk about another challenge. Women. Women are many in Africa, but actually they seem to be not that much integrated in the different countries. Let me explain. We have laws which grant rights to women. 
Some laws provide for parity or at least 30% of representation of, of women from place to place, but the fact is that even though we have good students in, in countries where we have many women, well, el elsewhere women are almost absent from decision-making bodies and it is becoming more and more difficult to interpret Mr. Mohamed Saleh. We need to recognize that women and youngsters made, art, made part make part out of the different dynamics happening on our continent. Furthermore, we talk about terrorism in Sahel, and in my region, hijacking is a reality, and we have a lot of piracy at sea. Almost all the acts of piracy ha are happening in the Gulf of Guinea and the thing is that there is this threat in Sahel. There is criminalized crime, um, organized crime which is threatening us as well and having to deal with these different threats is challenging to say the least. Money is being laundered, money is being generated by drugs and I think that all threats should be analyzed in a cross-cutting way. African leaders today think that uh, threats in the Sahel should be perceived as a global threat, not only a threat for the Sahel region or for a given country. And let's say the same thing to the Europeans. What is happening today in the Sahel region is not only the concern of Sahelians or Africa, no, it's a major challenge for the EU as well. Today, Libya doesn't exist anymore, and the threat is growing there as well. As a consequence, I need that we need to work together to face these global challenges, which mean that we need a global answer. Once again, thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you for this paper, which is really positive. I have read it thoroughly, and I think that the figures, everything, will support us in facing these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Anadif. But the very first thing which will need to be improved uh, is broadband between Africa and um, the EU because actually we can see that connection is a bit fishy here and we need more valid connections but anyway thank you very much this was to the point and very specific you mentioned the different challenges we are facing today thank you you have the floor so much, uh, uh, honorable parliamentarian Nart. Um, honorable parliamentarians Nart, Rafaela, and Zakharopoulou, fellow panelists, thank you for inviting the International Trade Center to engage in a discussion that is dear to my heart. Strengthen the partnership between our largest funder, the European Union, and our largest partner, the countries on the African continent. The pandemic has confirmed our interdependence. And as I've said on many occasions this past year, it taught us that global problems really do require global solutions. Building relations on mutual trust, mutual benefit and mutual respect will be critical to steering us against any future crises, including those on the horizon, such as climate change. 
I want to thank you for the excellent policy paper that is the backdrop to today's discussion. I'll zero in on three key issues. First, trade and development with a particular accent on women and youth. Secondly, connectivity and digital access. And thirdly, the green recovery. On trade, my opening call to you is to premise your future trading and economic relationship on the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. To remind you, the AFCFTA seeks to bring Africa's 1.2 billion people into a single market platform for trade. This is the blueprint that Africa has set for itself and the lens through which it wants to trade with the rest of the world. All of our efforts going forward must be aimed at respecting the integrity of this regional integration movement. Europe's experience and expertise in building a common market will be indispensable as part of this 21st century intercontinental partnership. And this economic partnership will take many forms, from addressing investment and value addition, to collaborating on private and public standards, to supporting digital connectivity and affordability, to creating trade routes to market. But I wanna focus on the role of women and youth. Data shows that 70 to 80% of small scale trading in Africa is conducted by women. In many respects, they are at the heart of the productive society and will be at the center of the recovery. The Europe-Africa partnership must have women's economic empowerment at the core of their cooperation. Invest in a woman and you're investing in a society. From supporting women's access to all aspects of economic life and placing special emphasis on women-owned and run businesses, Europe can support transformational change. I must mention our She Trades AFCFTA, where we support women-owned businesses to benefit from trade opportunities offered by the AFCFTA through capacity building, networking, and advocacy. IDC would be pleased to see how this work can be used to reflect the priorities of both Europe and Africa. I also wish to focus on youth entrepreneurship as one of the important pillars of your strategy towards Africa. Youth constitute more than 60% of Africa's population. In real figures, this is more than 720 million people brimming with energy and untapped innovation. Yet many of the African youth are jobless. To arrest this situation, the African Union has taken steps to address this through policy. Hence, I urge you to pay close attention to the AFCFTA protocol on women and youth, which should guide an approach to women and youth empowerment that engenders entrepreneurship, job creation, and seeks to curb the irregular migration of youth beyond the continent. On this last issue, I have to recognize the work that ITC and the EU have been collaborating on with the support of the governments in the Gambia and Guinea to build the capacity of MSMEs and entrepreneurial startups to provide sustainable and interesting job opportunities to youth in these countries. I'll now turn to connectivity and digital access. The pandemic has accelerated the expected digital connectivity of 10 years into one year. Many more of us are connected to the grid than ever before. Those MSMEs that survived the crisis were those that either had access to digital and e-commerce platforms or those that were quick to adapt, but not all have benefited. Internet access in Africa is still very low as compared to Europe. Only about 20% of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa has access to internet, as opposed to over 85% in the European Union. This notwithstanding, there are some incredible stories in Africa that deserve to be scaled up. Platforms such as M-Pesa in Kenya and Momo in Ghana have allowed for digital inclusion of the marginalized. In fact, I dare say that Africa leads other regions with its innovations in mobile money accounts, which are being used for settling domestic bills receiving remittances, and even peer-to-peer -peer finance. In fact, studies show that mobile technologies have generated 1.7 million jobs and contributed 144 billion US dollars to the African economy, which translates roughly as 8.5% of Africa's aggregate GDP. These are promising signs for Africa's development and enhancing digital access and affordability can scale this impact. We are aware, however, that greater digital access may also encourage or aid cybercrime, fraud, illicit financial flows, user repression, and division. The irony is that such unwanted outcomes of digital access do not affect Africa alone. They're not unique. Europe is also at the receiving end. That is why institutional capacity to combat such unwanted outcomes 
must also be strengthened in Africa to ultimately improve security and stability in Africa and Europe. Going forward, we at ITC are keen to build on our footprint in this area through our Ecom Connect program to facilitate the discussion of modalities to strengthen Europe-Africa relations premised on peer-to-peer -peer learning, connectivity, and access. I'll now turn to my final issue, that of the green recovery. Just this week, ITC launched its SME Competitiveness Outlook, which is focused on empowering the green recovery for MSMEs in particular. There are interesting results that can inform the Europe and Africa partnership. Climate change is no doubt the next pandemic, and according to Stiglitz and Stern, it will be in slow motion and much graver. And it is often those small firms and small countries that contribute the least to carbon emissions that will be most affected. There's an economic and dare I say moral responsibility for Africa and regions like mine in the Caribbean to receive greater aid for trade to allow adaptation, mitigation, and the adoption of green technologies. I'd be pleased to speak more about the support and elements of the findings during the open discussion. In essence, the relationship between Europe and Africa must continue to transition to a true partnership, even if the need for ODA and aid for trade remains. Trade that builds value addition rather than just value extraction. Trade that places women and youth at the center and trade that helps prepare African MSMEs for the eventual impacts of climate change. As a collective, these kinds of interventions will have real effects on peace and security, irregular migration, and poverty levels in Africa. I see that as a win-win result. ITC is here to be your partner. Our recently launched One Trade Africa program is ready-made to make many of the issues I raised above happen. I look forward to partnering with the EU and the African constituents on implementing this program. Thank you so much for the opportunity to address you, and I look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you because of your presentations that were realistic and not, let me say, as sometimes we hear empty words that they are nice words, but it is like a balloon, it's big but nothing inside. So thank you indeed, thank you indeed to all of you. So uh, now I am opening the floor to any questions and to you to answer. Uh, we are here to listen to you and not to give lessons. Thank you indeed. So I open the floor for questions and answers. All right, thank you very much, Javier. And thank you to all the speakers. And I definitely agree that uh, these were very, very good, insightful, realistic um, introductions. Um, and uh, let's continue indeed with the Q&A. Uh, I have not received a question yet from the public. So I'll just start with uh, one of our own questions. And um, I would like to start with, uh, uh, with, with Mrs. Martin Pratt. Um, I wonder, because creating better investment opportunities in Africa can contribute to sustainable de development, we all agree, I think, and um, as well as to the green and digital transition of the continent. Uh, but also in this respect, we uh, capacity building and effective investment policies can contribute to the goal of uh, promoting sustainable investment. So we wonder, would in your view the creation of a European Development Bank be a positive step in this regard, or are there other effective measures that can uh, contribute to the goal of sustainable development? What is your view on that? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, let me also uh, say that I found uh, all of the interventions are um, extremely enlightening and uh, a big uh, enrichment to the discussion you have started with your document. Um, on the question of how we can uh, contribute to sustainable development via specifically our investment policy. And I think that is, that is a very, very good and pertinent uh, question. We are increasingly talking about sustainable investment. 
And from Digitrade, what we are trying to do is to work with those partners in Africa that want to do so to see what kind of framework uh, can be put in place that facilitates investment. If you want, and I think you're very familiar with this discussion, we are moving from a discussion that was about protecting investment to a discussion that is about facilitating investment. And we're talking about the facilitating investment in those countries. Uh, and clearly this is not just for the benefit of foreign investors, but first and foremost, for the benefit of all of those, whether they are local, whether they are from other countries in Africa, whether they are from other countries in the European Union, to invest in those economies. And we are now starting discussions uh, with a number of uh, African countries as a very tentative uh, manner, but in some cases uh, in a more formal manner, like with Angola, where, where we have just had a round of discussions as to what kind of rules do you need to facilitate investment. And these are rules that go from transparency of procedures, facilitation of authorizations, uh, information in terms of local regulations. Uh, there is a wide array of steps that can be taken that we ourselves have taken in the European Union uh, is often what we refer to as domestic regulation. We have done that as well. And that we believe uh, may be as important as talking about market access or about uh, more classical trade discussions. I think from that point of view, um, sustainable development and initiatives to work with those African partners that want to do so to see how to have uh, that type of uh, framework that allows for facilitation of investment uh, is, is a very strong, um, if you want, new way for us to engage. You can see that already announced in our trade policy review document that I was preparing to in my uh, intervention. Um, and that I think it, it follows the same kind of pragmatic approach that your paper and many of the intervenants have highlighted in the discussion we had today. Thank you very much, um, very clear to me. And um, then I would like to continue with a question to, uh, for Mrs. Coke Hamilton. Um, and this is about, uh, this is about our uh, SMEs. So uh, also in our paper, we underline uh, the access for African products to the EU. Um, and it, it should be promoted, it should be supported. Uh, and as we in the EU develop policies to make the green and digital transition, this could prevent, uh, could prevent African companies from exporting to the EU market due to high regulatory burdens. So how can the EU and it, its member states better address export-related barriers for African companies, especially SMEs wishing to support, uh, wishing to export to the EU? What is your view on that? Um, okay, let me let me start with. Sorry, can you hear me? Sorry, can you mute? Thanks. Sorry, okay. please continue. That's okay. All right. Um, I I think as we mentioned in as I mentioned earlier in my statement that we had. Uh, launched this make a report on the issue of, of the green transition and how um, these issues are going to be difficult for some MSMEs to address. So I think the first thing that we need to do with relation to the standards is to, first of all, facilitate their compliance. So how do we help MSMEs actually um, incorporate meeting these standards uh, in their actual work? Um, right now, only 5% of micro uh, businesses and only 13% of small businesses actually meet one standard. So it really is prohibited. At the second level, we work with the companies themselves, the lead companies who have put in place certain standards uh, to see how they can harmonize 
the harmonization of standards is, is going to be very, very important in order to lower the impact on MSMEs. So if we can find a way, first of all, giving them information on how to comply um, through our standards map, we have over 290 standards listed on our on, on the standards map. Um, and also to see how we can enable the, the matchmaking to take place to enable them to understand. We also have green to compete hubs that we've set up in uh, three in Asia, two in Africa and one in the Caribbean, one in South America. And these are going to be platforms that help to multiply information on, on these kinds of standards and also to help MSMEs diversify their certification strategy. So we're looking at in innovative approaches, including group certification and shared costs, because this has to be a viable option. The other thing we want to do is to support innovation and digital technologies. I mean, it's now essential, as, as COVID has shown, it is now essential for uh, companies to be online, to have digital access. And this is a critical element of moving forward. So we have to in invest in digital skills. How do we lower the cost? Because one of the, the interesting statistics that came out recently from the GSMA is that 85% of the 4 billion people who are not covered or who do not have digital access are within a mobile covered zone. The problem is cost. And so how do we address the issue of cost and enable them to be able to connect within the context of, of MSME development? So I'll just stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much and also a very, very clear answer. Um, so I would like to uh, pass it on now to Javier and he will continue with asking the questions. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a problem because uh, questions that have to arrive are not arriving because our system is not working properly. So I want to ask pardon for all of you because we have many people that uh, were wishing to connect with us, but uh, they are not able to do that. So. I will address again the issue. Well, uh, this is a question for uh, uh, Asha. Uh, le, le problème que on a dans beaucoup de pays de l'Afrique, c'est l'appropriation de l'État, l'appropriation problems are associated to the ownership of the economy, administration by a, by a group. This is the most powerful group, uh, excluding other group. In that situation, uh, the stability of a country depends on the controls of the police and the military. And the need is the inclusivity, not of youth, not of women only, but of everyone. And it is important for all the African countries. How are we meet that equation? It is a contradictory. A power is, the power is based on exclusion, but requires inclusivity to ensure stability, stability, security for development. We can talk about uh, development for all our life, but uh, the development is um, owned, is grabbed rather by a power of exclusion. What do you think about that? Asher, if uh, we have uh, issues of connection with you, Anadif, obviously, you can also reply to this question. You could maybe reply uh, instead of Asher. Anadif, take the floor, please, my brother. Well, I do not want to uh, reply instead of, Anad of Asher. I'm going to provide my reply. <laughs> I mean, because he's not here, but of course, my brother, it, I meant you reply for yourself. Okay. Um, I talked about justice earlier on. We do need more citizen space so that all citizens feel that they have access to resources so that they can have access to power and to justice especially. These are indicators that could help citizens feel um, engaged. And this belongs to the challenges I was referring to earlier on. Access to power 
goes through elections. Unfortunately, we are all familiar with the issues related to elections. Generally, elections are creating problems, frustrations. I do think that we will have to focus on that very seriously. Um, because uh, wealth grabbing, and it is the base of wealth grabbing and uh, other problems. We do need to cooperate on judicial institution. Barack Obama, when he was in Africa, he explained that uh, Africa required strong institutions and not strong men. Institutions are creating a state justice, equality, democracy. So we need to build that state and we need to build people because people make the difference. If we have the right people in place, change may occur. Thank you very much, Anadith. We received a question. I will, I will read it. Shouldn't subsidies to the European Union companies that crush African companies be abolished? This would allow to more decent work and provide for jobs to Africans who will not leave their continent at the risk of their lives. So could we perhaps Mrs. Uh, Maria Martin Pratt to answer? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's interesting to hear uh, that uh, impression uh, from the side of uh, those that put the question uh, as regards the granting of subsidies uh, in Europe to European companies. Normally, we associate that debate with subsidies granted by other countries uh, to the companies. In, what I can say in that respect is that we do have uh, quite a strict control uh, of uh, what we call state aid subsidies granting the internal market. We have it uh, because it is also important that such subsidies do not distort uh, the function of the internal market, but also as a result, uh, that should be as well helping avoiding distortive effects in third countries. Now, I cannot here take a position that will say, there are never problems or there are never distortions uh, uh, created by subsidies granted. Uh, I know there is a very vivid discussion uh, in particular as regards subsidies granted in the agricultural sector, but that is a very wide debate that goes uh, well beyond my, my area of expertise. But I think basically what I'm trying to pass you as a message is, um, Europe does exercise a control in the subsidies that it grants. Uh, we do have problems, uh, uh, to be very frank, with subsidies granted by other economies, uh, very big ones, um, with no control. Uh, and that hurts not only the competition in Africa and for African companies, but also competition in Africa for European companies. So, yeah, I think that's what I can say at this point. But it's, it's, it's very interesting to, to, to hear that uh, we Europeans uh, complain about the subsidies granted by other third countries, and I can I can hear uh, hear a reflection about the effects of our subsidies. And um, it's something that uh, worth uh, discussing further. Thanks. Ashek il est avec nous ou il est parti ou c'est-à-dire la communication. Is Ashek with us or our Aren't you with us anymore? Uh, he's not with us. Eh bien, alors, je présente la question même okay. encore. À... Then I'll put the question to Anadif. There is no development if we do not have minimal safety reasons. What are the deep roots of the crisis of the Sahel? Jihadis. Is, is jihadism the illness or the symptom of a structural disease such as the loss of the presence of state and the um, f f 
failing economy. What is the impact on climate change, on demographic growth and the lack of um, economic prospects for the population? And I would like to add another, the uh, destruction of traditional order by the presence of criminal groups and uh, um, the impact on the economies. You have the floor. It is a global question. The main part of the security crisis we are facing now. And the connection is really difficult for the interpreters to carry out their duties. We are doing their all best for you. We are dealing with the symptoms while not taking care of the disease. We need to wonder what is triggering that insecurity. The state is not taking care of a big part of its citizens. They don't feel integrated. They don't feel concerned about what's happening in the capitals. I have often said that we uh, should have a bit more decentralization so that citizens feel involved. Many people feel not taken into account. And who decided to fill that gap? Terrorists. Sometimes they carry out justice, sometimes they offer services, and then they grab goods, they destroyed, destroyed the uh, traditional power you were referring to. But they have an ideology that is external. What's happening in Western Africa is coming from external, from uh, the East, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan. I think it needs to be said it, that intolerance and beheading people, it's not in the ways of Western Africa. Unfortunately, it is becoming a domestic reality. It is becoming a disease in our area. The interpreters cannot interpret. It is there are youngsters can we help youngsters in order to avoid those situations traditional mechanisms could solve some problems The interpreters will stop interpreting. It is not possible to carry out the service. Sorry. Je crois que là c'est une question importante et une fois je dis que nous sommes en train de régler les symptômes, mais il faut plus voir les origines du mal pour pouvoir les guérir. Merci. Thank you, thank you. I once again am unable to see the chat. So, anyway, Rafaela, do you still have questions? Rafaela, do you, did still you leave? have questions? Because I cannot see the questions on the chat. That I wish to ask uh, Mrs. Uh, Pamela Cole Hamilton. It is about the reality and the possibility, the real possibility of a clear and, uh, and uh, interchange, c'est-à-dire uh, relation économique avec l'Afrique. Economic relationship with Africa. We have before our, our eyes the great differences between European markets and African markets. If, we, if the Africans, as we ask, open their markets to our products, 
the possibility of creating an industry for themselves, even an agro-industry is going to be terribly difficult. So to create a situation of real partnership, you need some real protection to African markets in order that they are not swallowed. They are not, let me say, destroyed by our economy that they are much more higher in the possibility of, let me say, um, uh, uh, selling and uh, create an action there. What do you think about it, please? Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope I understood your question, but I think I understand that it will be difficult in terms of the opening up of the markets to the EU, et cetera, under the EPA and other, other arrangements. But I think what is important is to, as I said in my statement, to look at look at true partnership as opposed to um, what I would call a transactional relationship. If you have true partnership, then there will be investment and development on the ground so that African companies can begin to move up the, the, the value chain. Let's take, for example, the cobalt uh, from the Congo. 60% of the cobalt used in the making of electric car batteries in lithium, et cetera, are from the Congo. Yet, very little remains in that country. Very little is done to enhance their ability to produce even aspects of the battery. In other words, why can't there be a shifting in the commodity value chain to allow Africa to take advantage of so much of the extractive industries that are based there. I think that is a significant aspect of changing the dynamic with, with trade between the EU and Africa or even with developed countries generally in Africa. Um, I think the other issue is to look at foundational capacity building to enable the kind of technology transfer, the green technologies and the kind of investment needed to, to enable African companies, MSMEs and others to, to gain more from their engagement in international trade. Because right now it's very skewed and how do we enable them to, to build their capacity, uh, to engage more in digital entrepreneurship, to um, strengthen their, their agricultural value chains, to increase the, the returns uh, from the various commodity dependent developing country extractive industries. Those are, are critical elements that need to go into a true partnership as opposed to simply a uh, transactional trade relationship. Thank you indeed. Uh, this is something that uh, Mohamed Salah Nadif uh, already said that we need a real partnership and not just, uh, let me say, the relation of uh, how to engage in a better business, but uh, it is a realistic approach. There is a question that has arrived, uh, and this is for uh, Maria Martin Pratt. How those European Union Africa relations going to be positive for Africa in reducing the rate of indebtation of Africa? And it is connected, and I am, let me say, posing another point on it. Uh, debt in Africa is very much connected with corruption. And corruption is, let me say, defended by so-called national sovereignty. So how are we going to deal with, in the, with uh, debt in Africa if we are not dealing with corruption and corruption is affecting the root of uh, administrations in countries of Africa, that they are behind a barrier that is national proudness and national dignity? dignity for their leaders, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I can see, uh, I can see the, the frustration behind, behind the question. Look, this is, this is a wider uh, question, <laughs> that uh, question about trade and investment. But let me let me try to give you my view as to what we can do from, from, our, from our angle. So to try to get a bit more concrete uh, as regards something that otherwise I see comes to the, to what is a very frank and realistic discussion. Uh, but can we do something to help 
that type of problem, in this case, corruption, via the instruments we have at our disposal for uh, trade and investment. I think we can contribute. I'm not going to uh, pretend that we had uh, we have the magic answer. If we did, uh, we will be deploying it. And obviously the complexity of the situation is that it requires many actors. And first of all, uh, those that are uh, in the African uh, countries and governments. But at least from the point of view of trade, we have made now a big effort to not only incorporate the element of sustainable development uh, in terms of uh, better respect of environment and climate and respect of labor conditions, but it goes beyond and it goes on matters that um, do have an effect in, in that type of problem. Um, Anti-corruption uh, instruments. Uh, instruments that aim at uh, trading with minerals in a responsible manner, trading with timber in a responsible manner. All of the instruments that either we have in place or we're trying to put in place that try to ensure that there is due diligence exercise when you have European companies present in all the countries uh, and that obliges them uh, to avoid things such as uh, goods manufacture using forced labor to, to be traded. Uh, these are all the steps into one direction, which is to, to make the functioning of, of those economies uh, cleaner and to make sure that our trade is cleaner as well. And, and that is meant to be helping, uh, first of all, our partners uh, there. I think that is uh, what we can do uh, from our side, I'll be very interested to hear other, other ideas. Again, I'm talking about trade and investment as policies. Otherwise, it's, it's, a, wider, it's a wider debate. That's why as well, normally we, we act together, not only from the trade point of view, but also the foreign policy point of view with our external action service. So we do have also the uh, political framework agreements uh, that that can bring an important element into all these discussions, including as regards the respect of human rights. Um, so that's what I can give as a humble reply to a very challenging broad question. So, thank you very much indeed. We are now in our, I mean, the closing of, the, of this webinar, and we have still some, some minutes. When we are speaking, and I will do the closing remarks, when we are speaking about Africa, Africa, let me say, is as different as Finland from Portugal. So you cannot speak on Europe. We can, you can speak about cultural, economical uh, uniqueness, but uh, very different places from uh, Petsamo in the north to Algarve in the south. If there is a possible Africa, let me say South Africa, meaning South Africa, Botswana, Namibia, uh, even could be Zambia as well, uh, Malawi. And th there is a terrible Africa that is uh, the Congo, and it is a Central African Republic, and it is both Sudan's, mostly the South, and even Ethiopia that was a hope for Africa. Now it is in a terrible situation, not only in Tigray, but let me say the internal tensions. You have a ring of fire that begins in Mauritania and ends in the Red Sea. And you have another ring of fire that begins in Somalia and has jumped to Cabo Delgado in Mozambique. Uh, Mozambique at the time was, let me say, a peaceful area. So all these symptoms uh, is the consequence of an internal, very internal and very, uh, 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 very uh, dangerous disease that is not this instability, but it is the social economical instability. Climate change has deeply affected all the countries in Sahel. And when I say Sahel, it goes from the Red Sea again to the Atlantic. And it is affecting now the Gulf of Guinea. Never you could imagine that a country that was so stable as Burkina Faso is in a dire situation as it is. And that the turmoil is entering in a very stable country and let me say a very 
mm, successful country like Ghana, and now you have problems in the north of Ghana, that some minutes ago, if you can say minutes, some uh, months ago, it was totally unimaginable, out of any question. How could you speak about problems in Ghana? You cannot speak about, uh, uh, about development without stability. And you cannot speak uh, in stability only leaning on uh, military response. It is a double response. But we at the European Union, we have to do a very deep analysis of why after more than 10 years of spending hundreds of millions in security and development in Mali, we achieved to nothing and things are even worse than it was before. We have too many papers and too few people that touch the ground on the, on the place and they don't get their shoes dirty by the sun or by the dust. This is a reality. What we are doing most of the time in Africa is creating wonderful metaphysical responses to real realities. When I hear from uh, Mohammed Saleh Nadif that what we need is a real relation with Africa that is based not in giving lessons, but to listen to the people. And after listening to the people, learning what are their responses, even if the responses are not as good as our responses, they are their responses. So it is much more useful to act in accordance with the local people, if it is not a crazy approach, of course, than to be, be arrive with a wonderful approach from European institutions. Myself, as a member of the European Parliament, I want to do, let me say, a kind of self-analysis and self-criticism. Most of the time, we in the uh, Commission of uh, uh, Security and Defense and Foreign Affairs, it is a metaphysical uh, responses to real uh, situations. For example, we are able to speak about Libya without being a single day on Libya. It is like, let me say, uh, uh, thinking that you can't realize something if you don't see by your eyes. So let us go from the papers without leaving the papers and touching the ground and listening to the people and doing not our response, but the response that they need to their needs. This is my final approach. Frankly speaking, without security, no development. Without de development, no security. Without planning, no possibilities, but there is no possibility based on plannings that are not, that they are more, let me say, um, idealistic than not realistic. And the most of it, if we don't follow what are the needs of the people on the ground, uh, we are based in wonderful reports. And in, let me say, not touching the, the situation on the ground, We'll go to solutions, let me say, that we did in Darfur. In Darfur at the time, we say it is a problem between the blacks and the Arabs. And we were very happy with it. If you cross the Darfur, you will realize that the problem was drought. The problem was the lack of water. The problem was the dwindling of the resources. And so the tribes of the north that were the Arabs had to go to the tribes of the south and take their lands. It is as old as the Bible. It is Cain and Abel. And thank you very much for all your presentations that I do think that were absolutely realistic and not based in metaphysics. Thank you indeed.